we are going to all think of ourselves as people working in a health center. And we have to think now about how we would guide health center people to make a micro plan to reach all every community. So we're going to go through a series of steps. And we've actually got some forms here which you can fill out as part of the workshop. We're not going to collect these, so we're not going to ask you to do a micro plan. We just want to ask your view on whether this approach is something that you can use. That's all. We just want your opinion. So I'm going to start off with just a few points about what we're trying to do. And I would like to say also that this is a joint presentation. So Gerald will be involved, and I will be involved. And uh, so there will be um, different presenters during this course of this uh, presentation. Now, can I just start off with this one here? Now, everybody's heard of reaching every district. You're all familiar with that. That's been going since 2002. Now we have reaching every community. Why? Because we have now got a different situation. Reaching every district will get you to about 80%. It won't get you to 95%. Right, why? Let's have a look and see. We have five points for reaching every district. We know these very well. Outreach, supportive supervision, linking with, okay. We're, we're very familiar with those. Now, if you want to reach every community, it's somewhat different. We need to identify the marginalized communities. That's what we're talking about. Those people who are living under slum conditions, who are wandering around the streets, the homeless, etc. Uh, those people, those are the very people we have to reach. So we identified the marginalized. We update microplans to include those marginalized communities, the very ones we're talking about. Remember in the first session we talked about those people, the inequities, the differences in coverage, the kind of groups of people that we have no knowledge about the numbers. We have to then, the third one, we have linking services with communities when, when we talked about reaching every district, but we have a much more precise thing that has to be done if we want to reach every community. It's actions to reduce social distance. Oh, social distance is a funny kind of concept. Physical difference is a, you know, that's physical difference. Social distance, you can have a health center and on the other side of the street, a community, and the two do not connect. Yeah? Is that, that's right, isn't it? Why don't they connect? Maybe they feel they don't belong in that health center, because maybe they speak a different language. We don't know. Many reasons. Yes, that's the social distance. And that is one of the biggest problems we have in every country, the social distance between people who may be They've migrated to the area looking for work. They don't feel part of that society. So we have to reduce that social distance, and we'll talk about how that can be done. We need to monitor the immunization performance within the communities. Now, the, you know, this is not about coverage because we don't know the numerator and the denominator very often. We may get a numerator because we go around and vaccinate, we don't know the denominator. So how do we actually find out? You have to go and monitor in the communities, check what's happening. You have to visit them to find out what's happening. It's legwork. And we have to make sure the resources are getting to those prioritized, marginalized communities. You know very well, if you're reaching every district, very often the resources get as far as the district, they don't get out to the health center. So how do we monitor getting the resources to the health center where it's needed. At the bottom there, I've said that, you know, lots of words we use, high risk, marginalized, underserved, they're all the same. Let's not try to distinguish between one and the other. We're talking about children who are being missed and should be vaccinated, have a right to be vaccinated, but are not being vaccinated. And we can use lots of different words for them, but it doesn't matter. Okay, so just, just a little bit more about why we have to reach every community. The first thing, high population immunity can only be achieved when every community is fully immunized. And please, let's not forget, EPI is not about coverage. It's about disease reduction, isn't it? 
doesn't matter what you say, you've got 120 coverage, you've still got a measles outbreak. It's about disease reduction, so we have to think about that all the time. We have to fully immunize every community in order to get disease reduction and population immunity. So the problems with, I'm using the, the issues there about reaching every district and comparing them with reaching every community. With reaching every district, remember the first thing you did was to look at your coverage data and look at those uh, unimmunized and the dropouts. Remember, that's the first step we did. But we don't know the coverage because we don't know the denominator. What do we have to do? This is a very important point for reaching every community. We use local knowledge of health facility staff. You know what it's like. You go to a health center, they're overwhelmed, they're busy. They've got 100 children waiting to be vaccinated. They find it very difficult to reach other communities because they're so busy, but they know. They know who is living in their area. They know the names of the communities. They know the people who live there. They are the people to ask, it's their local knowledge. And as we'll see, one of the steps we're going to use is actually how to get your health center staff to tell you the names of the communities and some approximate population. We can't use the census data when we have lots of unimmunized um, people wandering around the place, transients and migrants and so on. We cannot use the, the coverage data. So we use local knowledge. Remember that district plans and budgets, often they are created at the district from the province or, or whatever, and they may not be adequate to reach every community because the budgets have been created maybe a long time ago and they, they list out the health facilities and the proximate populations, but they're not enough because the population's gone up by 40% in the last couple of years, but the budget stayed the same and the planning cycle is the same. So we have to have microplans um, that identify all the communities and make sure that they are all, uh, and there are sufficient budgets and, and supplies for them. And the other thing here is very important, is community level engagement, um, which is what we found in reaching every district, often there is not sufficient community level engagement in marginalized areas because uh, again, the district planning is a sort of traditional system of planning which misses out many of the marginalized communities. So here, with reaching every community, we have to be able to engage with the marginalized areas, that is, with community leaders and so on. So those are the, that is why we are moving now from reaching every district to reaching every community. Uh, and essentially because we will never get up to the coverage we need for disease reduction if we only get to 70 or 80 percent with reaching every district. So I've just summarized here and trying to put together these ideas of equity and reaching every community uh, and micro planning which we're going to do. Very simple summary here. If we have reaching every community, what are we talking about here? Just five simple things. Identify and map. Okay, we, very, we understand that very well. Everybody's been doing that for years. But we have to prioritize the underserved, and maybe that's not happening. We have to connect the health centers with the communities. We have to monitor those very communities, often by visiting them and checking cards. It's hard work, it's leg work. And uh, lastly, we have to provide and track these resources to make sure they're getting down to pay for those activities that you need to do, to pay for the legwork, essentially. Now, this is a busy slide, I'm sorry. So this is um, what we're going to be doing. We have eight steps for microplanning. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to read them all out. We will go through them one by one uh, as we progress um, and you will have a chance to, to try them out. So um, I think I'm going to leave that slide there and then I'm going to ask for the next uh, step one uh, which I think Gerald is going to do and I'm going to put this slide, slide up here. Yeah, thank you very much, Julian.
for that introduction. I'm Dr. Sekito Kare Gerald. I work with the JSI in Uganda. We support routine immunization at national level and district level. And all our work is really in institutionalizing REC, trying to make sure that REC is implemented in as a routine rather than something which is really taught. In identifying and mapping out high risk communities or underserved communities, I think we really need to focus and we need to remind ourselves that as Julian has put it, that our goal is to reach every community. And if we have to reach every community, then we need to know where these communities are. It is very interesting. These communities are within our other large communities. And we always pass them and go and vaccinate in other places and we pass them because they have special needs. And because we don't address those special needs, they can't come for our services. So it is very, very imperative and very important that as we try to map out these high-risk communities, we appreciate some of these key things. When we talk about special needs, whom do you think knows these special needs for these communities? Themselves. Wonderful. It is themselves. So as we map, as we plan, as we do everything, we need to talk to them. And this is the linking of services with the communities. We need to talk to them and ask them, where, how do you want us to serve you? And that is key. Communities, as we are in this room, have very many competing priorities. If a family has to look for food, they can't come for immunization. If your immunization is going to compete with the looking for food for the family, they will not come. So when you talk to them, those are some of the things they will look at and say, hey, don't come on this day, come on this day. So it is uh, imperative because the special needs may be beyond the immunization. We didn't really need to work with the other stakeholders in this whole process. It is not health only in this aspect. We really need to work with the other stakeholders and never forget the communities. Never forget the communities. So having made that, those few points, I just want to remind ourselves that as we talk of reaching every community, which health system level are we relying on? It's not a national program, it's not provincial, it's not a district. We are relying at the health facilities, isn't it? And we know the capacities at the health facilities. So if we want to rely on them, we need to support them. And the first thing we didn't need to support them with is to help them map out their catchment areas. We could use several methods. <clears throat> in matching up the catchment areas for health facilities. But to bring it in context of REC reaching every community, we really need to first look at, say, a district level. And in the district, we identify all communities in the district and say which health facility is going to serve which community. And once we have done that, we already started drawing the maps because we know this map is like this, this parish is like this, this village is like this. So when you say this parish belongs to this university and this one, then you will do that. In the process of doing that, you will know the high-risk communities. You will know those communities who have not been reaching, but because nobody has ever taken attention to look at all communities and know who is serving which community, then you will be surprised to become very glaring that some communities, we have just been missing them. We did one of the mapping in Kampala, a city, and the authorities were surprised to realize on that day that some communities had nobody serving them for five years. 
and these are some of the communities we are talking about. So generally looking at all of the communities and knowing who is serving which community will help you fish out these communities. <coughs> Excuse me. And the moment you do that, then you will get these catchment areas very clearly. And the every health facility can sketch out their catchment area. This is uh, really a very sophisticated, very sophisticated catchment area map, but we could get maps which are sketched out basing on the geographical demarcation of the catchment areas of these uh, health facilities. So in a way of process of how we could map out the health facility catchment area, one, you need to identify key stakeholders to work with. I said it's not health alone. So we really need to involve other stakeholders. Who are the people who know the social distances and barriers to immunization? Such that we can really address them. And when we are on the same table, then we shall list, use the existing list of communities and once we use the existing list of communities, then we should know which community should be served at which service delivery point. Are we moving together? Sometimes I can really move very fast, but if you think that I've lost, I've lost you somewhere, please, yes. or may not belong to another health facility catchment area. So they're lost out of this mapping. They may be lost out of this mapping because they think the health facility thinks it's part of here and these people think it's part of here. How have you, uh, what are some of the sort of best practices, I don't know if you're coming up to this, in making sure that these marginalized communities are somehow included? I'm sorry, I will use this. And thank you very much, Nahat. What I will have been trying to tell you about, take this one to be our district, right? We have the district health office, whatever you call it, and we have different health facilities. Oh, sure, sorry, thank you. We have different health facilities, maybe B, maybe C, maybe D, maybe E, maybe F, somewhere. And what we are talking about is that this has different communities, different areas. And as you quickly notice, some of these areas have health facilities and the others don't have. Are we together? The first thing is at this level, working with the different health facilities to see who is going to serve this community. Who is going to serve this community? 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 And you come up with a clear list and say health facility C, you are serving this community, you are serving this community and this community. With clear geographical demarcations, that will take care of no area left, no man's land. And once you have done that, then you have somebody to rely on in reaching these communities. Are we together? Now, when you have done that, then you'll have no people left in no man's land. The moment you have done that, then now you're going to work with this health facility to make sure that they plan with these communities now on how to cover even the community which is here. Remember, the communities know better what they want. And we should never assume that we should plan and decide for them. They are not consumers. They are key stakeholders, and Julian and others have clearly put it. They are key stakeholders. The moment they withheld their child like this, your vaccines, your efforts will all go to vain. Are we together? So let us work with them. Let us ask them, and the moment we sit with the stakeholders, we map out so that we don't leave any place uncovered, 
Then now we work with the health facility. And the health facilities work is to identify those communities within their geographical catchment area. And they work with them to say, this is what we have. We have so many outreaches we can conduct within our resources. If we have so many outreaches and we have our static here where we vaccinate from, then tell us where should we put this outreach so that it can serve this community. They actually map out and they say, my village here can reach here. My village here can reach here. If you think that that village and that village should be served here, move this outreach to that point so that the distances are, I mean, you get it. So eventually some communities would opt out and say, no, 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 you put us to be served under that community, but that community there is hostile with us. We want to go to another health facility, allow that freedom. Let them move, because what we want is that they should access services, and we need to listen to them. So that is all about really mapping. So we have mapped out the catchment area for health facilities. The health facilities are working with the communities to see where should we locate the, the outreach or the service, and which communities are going to be coming to that service, and then after that, you ask them which day of the month should we come for your immunization. It's important to know their day because the communities have competing priorities. So if you know the day that you think they will be ready for you, it's wonderful. If you want to go deeper, you may look at the time of the day and say on which time of the day we make sometimes mistakes and we go to outreaches or for services when people are going to go in their gardens or whatever work they are doing. And we miss them. And rightly so. I mean, they are, they are, that one is better than immunization as far as life threatening is concerned. So we didn't need to have, first of all, the health facility catchment areas clearly agreed upon at maybe district or health facility level, then you come down to the health facility, work with the communities to identify which communities. They may be the transit communities, they might be the urban slums, they might be the street communities, but who knows them better? It is the, 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 those people whom you, you must work with. And it is important that you agree with them as to where, where should we put the immunization outreach. When that is the day and the time, and which health facility they prefer. They have a choice. They have a choice. So you really need to give them that, uh, that choice. Plan with them. Plan with them. And that is uh, very key. Okay. Now, I have a few questions for you, for each country. Are health facilities preparing such maps? Are you sure all health facilities geographically know that my catchment area passes here over this road, by this forest, by this river, and it, this is my area? Who is responsible for doing it? What are the special challenges? What are the special challenges, if any, for creating facility maps for high-risk communities. And I've said how these high-risk communities are going to be identified in the general process. Because as you see to the VHTs, they will tell you, hey, like I was with our, my colleagues from Jordan, they said, ah, we have known there are some Pakistani refugees who are casual barras in some areas. And that is wonderful. But how did they know once you ask them, they must have got it from the community. So we really need to get those high-risk communities. What type of information do you need about the high-risk communities in your country so that you can serve them? Are we together? Any quick responses because we have very little time? 
Jordan, Iraq, Syria, Sudan, Lebanon. Lebanon. Yes. Yeah, we have a comment from a very recent pilot that we're doing in Beirut, in one of the vulnerable areas in, uh, actually it's Qada Abu Abda, but um, it's a bit outside Beirut. So uh, we have a community that we know is, uh, is vulnerable based on uh, results of a survey that we know we need uh, vaccinated, vaccination activities in that area. So we have a primary health care center in the same area. And the challenge in Lebanon is that if you pull out the administrative maps, uh, you uh, would not find um, uh, structures in that area because most of them are illegal. So what we used were the Google Maps. And uh, uh, with, with our UNICEF colleagues, we went to the primary health care center and uh, we asked them to identify a person who is from the community who can help us actually map uh, on the, in the field all those streets that are uh, seemingly obvious on a Google map. The challenge was that when the, uh, when the field teams would go into the, the area, they would find uh, uh, streets that are no longer there or the streets that they could not pass from one area to another. Uh, so that had to be mapped on the, on the ground for them to facilitate their activity. Uh, the other thing was, like you mentioned, is uh, political affiliation. For example, part of that area would, not, would be reluctant to go to get vaccinated at the center because of the NGO that's running the center is politically affiliated to another party. So they would rather go get their services elsewhere. And for us, we were determining that these people should be in the catchment area of this specific PHC. So these are the challenges that we, we are facing um, I guess in most vulnerable uh, areas, uh, we will see that all over Lebanon. Uh, so our main um, challenge was finding uh, maps, being able to actually use them on the ground. And uh, as I said, the affiliation thing that, that we would be referring to one center and the people would be reluctant to go to get their services there. Yeah, thank you very much, Lebanon. That is very, 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 really, very, very, I mean, it's a real experience, and this is what I've been talking about. The key solution there is talk to those people. If you talk to them, they would even tell you this place passes here, this passes here, this one passes. You may not go to the Google Maps and others. Talk to them. Listen to them. So this process, I've really almost gone through it. We needed to use the existing lists of communities, but you needed to update them as necessary. You needed to estimate the populations for each community using an estimate. You don't really need to have all, everything that these are maybe census figures or anything. You can use just a multiplication factor on households. State whether any communities are underserved. And through the mapping process, you will have already identified these communities. Describe the community characteristics. As we work with the communities, you will tell them, you people, who are you, what are you doing, and whatever. And they will tell you exactly whether they are migratory, whether they are whatever, then you will know. Describe services, service delivery method, distance from health facilities. Please work with them. I always get interested in when we emphasize distance from health facilities. It may not always be true that health facilities, communities near to the health facilities would like to go to that health facilities. It may not be true. Some communities prefer to walk long distances than the nearby health facilities. So, this is our assignment currently, and each group has uh, this form with you. We asked you to come with the data if you came with it. We want you to look at one health facility 
if you can map out its whole catchment area and you know all the communities it serves, but particularly we want you to be interested in the underserved communities. Please highlight them and show this is an underserved community, but use the whole table to identify the communities for that health facilities, look at the underserved and estimate their populations and decide basing of course now on the distance alone but you need to go back you need to ask the health facility to talk to them and see how they want to be served whether they go to the nearby place or they want to be served separately because of their unique 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 so we're just taking to yeah before the one before sorry okay so you have this on the paper I think everybody's filled it in. Some have even got detail, the phone number of the uh, contact person, which is great. Uh, so do, if this makes sense to you, you all agree, then we can move on to the next step. Yes? If people have got problems with it, please just put up your hand and tell us the problem. We'd like to know. Otherwise, we'll move on to the next step. Okay, everybody? I think you've done a great job. I've been going around looking. It seems you came prepared. With the, with the data that we needed. Fantastic. Okay. So, can we, should we go on to the next thing now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Juliana, and the groups and teams for that exercise. Um, we are moving to the next step, but we have some materials for mapping which we could share with you. Some of them are already shared in the Dropbox. And uh, we have some hard copies we could share so if you wish to, to have them. We want to move quickly to step two in the mapping and uh, the visiting of the health facilities. We really need to analyze a health facility and a community. And a community. And this form is going to help us to analyze one community. One underserved community, the health center providing services there and available community resources. I like available community resources because commonly we do not tap into the communities. I want to tell you communities can contribute greatly to immunization. If you engage them, if they own the program, if they have planned where all outreaches are, then that is that. We really need, you have this in your forms, right? We may go to this page where there is this page in the forms which we provided and look at them. We want you to look at the official and real population of the community if they are different. They may be different actually. And in a very brief description, try to describe the people living in the community by some of those you can put them either migrants, new settlements, or whatever, and any data on use of immunization services by the community. You really need to look at that. Then the description of health center that serves the high-risk area of community. How far are they? What is their capacity in terms of staff, cold chain status, transport, etc. And any problems with the health center. You will, all this will come when you are talking to the health center itself. They are the ones who are going to tell you. And the, the, first, the, second, the second row, when you are talking to the communities themselves. What immunization services are available to the community? That is the health center, which will tell you that. And talk to the community. Sometimes the health center may, may think that you are giving that service, but not. Then a brief description of the people in the community who can be community resources, because you need to work with them more regularly. Describe any problems with the communication cooperation in the community. That is why when you identify the community resource focal point, you really need to get contact or communication, phone, whatever, how you can co commonly link up with them. Can we ask you to have a look at the, the second page, form two? This just put one or two words, that's all. If you already have written one line about a particular community, 
uh, you may be able to very quickly fill in form two. Just, uh, just give it a try. One or two words about each one. As a manager, as a manager, I would want to know about the services available to a community. That's what this is about. Is it is uh, are they able? Is that particular health center able to reach this community or not? So, just very quickly, if you could try that um, form two to fill that in with a few words. That's all. Thank you very much. So just very briefly, as a management tool, as a manager, I would want to know about my community and health center, and we've gone through that. That helps us make a plan. If we know more about the community and know more about the health center, we heard from Djibouti, a flexible strategy. Sometimes it's fixed, sometimes it's outreach. It depends upon the, the people and where they are, very good. And so it depends very much on knowing who the community leaders are and maybe even working with NGOs. So I think this is just a management tool and we're going to move on to the next. Thank you very much. I think we've understood. Step three is we need to identify obstacles to full immunization from the community demand side and health service supply side. All we know, all we know and what we are very sure of is that that community is not properly served. Few children are vaccinated in that community. Either we use the card checks and we move on, move on, but we know that that community is not well covered. So our challenge is to know why they are not vaccinated and then we come out with the solutions. Key thing is that we don't know as health workers on our own, we can't know everything. So we really need to work with the key stakeholders and the communities to actually understand why they don't come. Some of the reasons why they don't come are very, very, you may not even know them. They are very trivial. I want to give a very good example here. In my country, if you put an outreach at a church, in a community which is basically Muslim, they will not go there. And they will never tell you that we can't go there because of the church until you ask them. Or you ask them, can you, where can we put the, the, the outreach? And they say, oh, oh, that's very good. Put it at our chairperson's office. But the other place is there. You get it. So we didn't need to ask them. And we didn't need to begin grouping them. We didn't need to group the, the, the reasons are either on the su supply side or the community side. It's very important to get the root causes. Sometimes we address things which are up here. Poor social mobilization. Why? We have radio messages, we have uh, com community focal point person, but why are they not reaching? Maybe the language they are using is not known in the high risk communities. They can't communicate to them. Maybe the strategies they are using are not the right ones for the community. It takes us back to the special needs of these communities. We need to identify them. In working with the stakeholders, let us not forget the leaders, civic and political. Sometimes we make a mistake as health workers and only talk to ourselves. And we only want to talk what we, we know, what we hear, what we want. But the leaders have other reasons why these communities are not being served. And we need to involve them. It is not only just getting new information as to why these people are not coming, but the leaders will own these plans. They will own them. They will get the information that health is struggling with such and such a community. They will have to mobilize resources for us. We may not mobilize resources for us, and that is very, very important. Uh, we need to group the causes, the root causes, according to the service level. And we have given the health service supply and the community demand. I want to expand this a bit, and I will give the reasons. One, all these, if, if people are not being reached, reasons might be at national, 
They might be at district or provincial. They might be at the health sub-district. It might be at the district. It might be at the health facility or the community. If you group these causes according to those levels, you are already saying who is responsible for addressing them. And that is key. And because you have involved all these stakeholders, they are on the table, then everybody, the district leader, will say, oh, this is ours. The community will say, this is ours. The health facilities, this is ours. And the guidance we give to health facilities is plan, put in your plan what is in your mandate. You should not plan for the district. You should not plan for the health sub-district. You should not plan for national level. But plan for what you have to do. Because every problem, despite all those many root causes, whichever root cause you tick off, it will improve or it will reduce on the problem. Are we together? Any questions? I've said many things. When we have looked at all of this, sometimes the challenges we have are much bigger than the resources we have. So we need really to prioritize and help the health facilities to prioritize. When you are here at the national level, when you say prioritize, it is very obvious. To the health facility, it isn't. You really need to help them and get maybe some criteria to see which one should they prioritize. And uh, we need to develop solutions. As we develop solutions, these problems are not happening to our communities for the first time. There are other health facilities, there are other districts, there are other countries where these problems have been. And let us learn from others. Let us know what did they do and see how we can adapt that to our health facility. It could be to our country, it could be to anything. And you can see just in this audience here, we have countries at different levels, different experiences. Let us try to benchmark, let us try to learn from them. Solutions are commonly suggestions. They may not have any statistical proof that when I do it, it will work. So it is important to have, to try them out and say, yes, they say when you do this, it works. Plan very well, do it. Monitor and see whether it is actually working. And if it works for you, good enough, adopt it. Make it your routine. If it doesn't work, reconsider and say, is there anything we need to do right? Can we change a bit? Can we abandon it? No, this doesn't work in our country at all. We really need to think of something. Because when you are developing the root causes, you have very many. You only prioritize the few. You have a place where to pick what to try. And you will keep trying. And I want to tell you, if you try one and two, you will find that you are solving very many. That is the experience. We have a table, which is uh, table three in our working booklets. Identify the obstacles to full immunization from community demand side and supply side. On the supply side, you may extend it to have these other levels so that when you put a problem there or cause there, it directly tells you who should address it. Can I just say, look, the, the purpose of our doing this is to try to understand. Remember working at health facility level. We want the health centers to realize that there are problems both on the demand side and the supply side. You know what I mean. It is common for a health center to blame the mothers for not turning up on when they do outreach or for not coming when they're expected to. And for the, the mothers to blame the health center, said when we go there, there's nobody there. So, you know, two sides. There are two sides to this. So that's what we're trying to do here. Just trying to keep it very simple. Maybe we can think of some common obstacles, what the community demand, what they would expect and also what the health service uh, problems they would have with supply. Just something very simple. 
because the idea of this is a management tool again, maybe this is useful for some health centers to go through this for them to understand their problems on both sides. It's them as well as the community, not blame, just blame the community. I was a district health officer and initially I used to think it's money, 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 money. Incidentally, when you get money, you quickly realize that you don't have enough time, you don't have enough human resources to really consume this money. It's very common. And to link it up to mapping, if you have mapped out your service delivery points very, very well, and if this service delivery point is serving this area with those villages, and you have worked with the communities to properly know that anybody who is here can reach here, anybody who is here can reach here, this one can reach and others, then you can use the same money, whether there is an IDP camp, whether they are refugees, whether they are whatever, if you've talked to them, they should use the same money to reach this outreach and you can serve them. The whole thing with the mapping is that you know that whoever lands in that geographical area can be able to reach where you provide the services from. However, if you put services according to your convenience as a health worker, then you are going to face challenges. In this catchment area, if your services are here, because that's where you can reach very well, then you have challenges. Money is one issue. But we should remember, as I finish, if this is the problem, if this is the problem, it has many causes. And each root cause takes a portion of it. Let us not fear, even if money has not yet come, let us start with some of those causes which we can handle within our resources. And they will chop off, chop off a very big chunk of our problem and we shall improve. In immunization, we don't target to reach 100. We target to reach maybe 90. And that is sufficient. Thank you very much. Now, we're going to talk about making updated health facility microplans. So far, we've done a sort of analysis, a problem analysis. Now let's think about what we need. We've already talked about the list of population and map. We don't need to do that. We've done that already. That was step one. Now, step two, this looks terrible. This looks absolutely terrible table. You'll see that. Um, please look at the page number six. Page number six. Let me just explain what this is all about. Okay. This is a master list of children under two years of age. What's this all about? Okay. So. We're not asking you to fill in this form now, but we just want you to consider this as another management tool. Let us put ourselves in the, uh, in the position of health center workers. Health center workers are surrounded in a city by large areas of very crowded streets, maybe urban slums, maybe settlements, all around them. The people are coming and going all the time. They really don't know who's living there and who is not. That's the situation. What can we do about that? A situation that has been used in other countries, uh, a method, is the master list. Now, everybody knows what is a master list from polio eradication, right? That was something that we has been done in the past before doing a polio campaign. You get a write a list of the, of the children, it's usually just numbers and may not even be names. For this kind of master list, this is something not for the whole population, but only to do in certain areas where you think there are lots of children you don't know about. They are not in the denominator. We call them marginalized communities, densely populated areas. What does this form do? It's, it looks at the name of the child, its age, uh, in date of birth as well, name of the mother, some kind of address, and then it's a question of looking at the immunization card, if they have one, and writing down just a tick, a tick on the doses that they may have received, 
It also includes the, the mother's tetanus toxoid. It may not be relevant in some countries, but it includes that. And the remarks. Remark can be no card. So, you see what, I just want to get your views on whether this is a management tool that could be used. Now, you don't need to go to every house. Uh, it does mean walking and knocking on doors and asking for cards. You don't need to go to every house. You just need to go to um, several, maybe 10, maybe up to 20, to get an idea. Get an idea of what's happening. Is this along, I walk along this street, I knock on the doors, 10, 20 houses. I find that half the children have no card, or maybe they've only just had one or two doses. That tells me this is an area we need to target. As a manager, that is a useful piece of information. Even if I find they have no card, that is useful information. Maybe they come from another place, left the card at home, we don't know. But you see that any information you get on this is useful as a manager to know whether this is a high risk area or not. You may find that children are fully immunized. Maybe that's great, then you don't need to worry about that area. So you see, see the tool is there is telling you whether this is a high risk area or not. You can use this information to update the immunization register because you will have names there and you have addresses. You can just fill in the line on the register. Maybe some doses a child has already received, not in the register, but on the card. Or it might be the other way around, in the register, but not on the card. So you can update your register. Maybe you can take the register with you, or maybe you can go back to the health center and update the register with this data. So we're not going to ask you to fill this in, and it's some, it is possible to have an exercise um, but I'm not going to do that now in the interest of time. But if we were training health center workers, we would g have an exercise with this. We'd either do it in the fields or we would give them data to fill in. So there are lots of ways of using this. My question to you, all of you, is please comment whether this is doable. Is this something doable or not? Yes, I think this is just a tool and, and uh, it, it should be adapted for each country to be able to use. We just want the concept, the idea that you would be able to identify high-risk areas using a tool like this. And then you, this would give you also the names of children who you need to follow up on. Thank you. Um, What's here? This is a session plan. I'm going to talk about that. Okay. So, two ideas here. One is equity. All children need to be reached equally. Everybody needs the same opportunity to get fully vaccinated. But it doesn't mean to say that you're going to have the same number of sessions, but it depends on where you live, how far away. But you all need to have an opportunity to get fully vaccinated. So that's what the session plan is about. Let us think now, I'm thinking about an urban area. Let's think about an urban area. See, this is a session plan. And Everybody ha knows about session plan. Everybody has session plans. Uh, this is nothing new to you. But I just want to try to get this idea of the management tool, how we can use it, maybe get health centers to use it better, and how it can be monitored. So just looking at this here, we start off with the community. Now, the, the important point here is that first column there must have absolutely every community. That's the equity thing. Every community must be listed. All those areas, those streets, those blocks that don't get reached have to be down on that list there. That's what equity is all about. Everybody has an equal chance. Then you have to say um, what you're going to do. So the second column says whether they're high risk or not. You probably know already by doing a, 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 an analysis or trying to check their immunization status. Some idea of the target population. Remember, we did that in the first step, some kind of estimate. Um, and then the next one, what kind of service delivery? Is it fixed? Is it mobile? Is it patrol? And we're talking about an urban area here. What trying to get to the idea that some urban areas need to get outreach. Yes, am I? Do you agree with that? 
some urban areas need outreach because it's very difficult to get them to come to the health center. So we have to think about that. Urban area, we may need outreach. Then we have to say how often. Is it quarterly? Is it uh, bi-monthly? Or is it monthly? We can decide. You know very well what is, if it's a small population and far away, there's no way you can get there every month. Maybe you only need to get there quarterly. But if it is a big population in a city, you will never uh, catch up unless you have a monthly session for them. So these are the unmade. In between, we have a session maybe every two months. So we have various strategies, how you're going to reach them, how often you reach them. Then the next column there says a collection point for outreach and mobile. So we're talking now about um, having in a city, you would have a collection point. And everybody's familiar with that. It's not in the health center. It's outside the health center. But it's some familiar place where people can go, uh, where a, a site can be set up for outreach. Um, of course, we know from measles and polio campaigns, we've been doing that for years, setting up uh, temporary sites um, in cities. So we know how to do that. Um, then the next column says the name of the community focal point and the mobile number. I, I think some people already brought that here to the meeting. They, they already record that kind of thing, but we need to be able to contact, especially for outreach, we need to say, call them up and say, there's going to be an outreach tomorrow, next day or something. You need somebody to call from the health center to the community, you need to remind them there's going to be an outreach there. Or indeed, if it's a fixed site, maybe remind uh, somebody in the community that they need to come to the health center. Either way, that's an important thing to have. The collection point, the name of the community, focal point, mobile number, the person in the health center who's responsible, transport, maybe a vehicle is needed, or it's a motorcycle, or it's a car, or whatever, or a bus, whatever. And then, very important here, I've just put six months on this because it's table will be too busy, but we should have the date scheduled and the date held. So we need to monitor. So we know in the end, the total for that month, total held and total scheduled, we need to monitor the sessions to know they are actually taking place. That's very important. If you cannot hold the session on a particular date, you need to think maybe you move it to the next month, but you need to make sure they do get a session. So that's the point of monitoring. So again, I'm going to stop there. This is a management tool, and I, we would like to know your opinion on whether this seems something you can use, something you are familiar with, some comments about it. Um, maybe some people could actually fill in one line because they already have already some data uh, about a particular community in a health center. Could try it. This next one is uh, not, nothing very complicated. We need to talk about monitoring. We need to talk about monitoring now. How to m monitor the status of marginal. This, this is very much like the, the uh, previous one we did, table three, which was the master list. Very similar. Remember the master list, okay. We've done a master list. Now we're talking about monitoring. This, of course, you can, do a, you can use a master list more than one time. It can be done frequently. But we need to think now, what is a simple way of monitoring inside a marginalized community to find out what's going on? The same idea. You can take a sample of mothers, and you can check just whether what doses have been given, and then you can make a decision. You see there, you just, the number of children, no names, no addresses, it's just a very quick tool. You go into the, uh, you go into the community, and you ch tick which of those vaccines have been given. Sorry. This is page 11. Okay. And then you can decide whether the child is fully, partially, or none has no card. Sorry, on page 11. Just very, yeah, very quick 
a quick way. You can get um, volunteers to do this. You only need to take a sample. You don't need to do a whole uh, master list. Master list has all the uh, details about the child, about the name, the address, and so on. This is only to go in and find out what's happening as a monitoring tool after uh, some sessions have been done. You need to find out what's going on. So you can, uh, you can use this at any time within the community. This is something that you need to actually visit a community to do. So that is the, uh, the issue about this. It requires a visit to a community to monitor. Normally, we monitor by collecting reports and providing coverage reports. In situations where you have a marginalized community, you are not sure what's going on because coverage reports are inaccurate, you can consider using this simple tool by checking immunization cards very rapidly without bothering about name and address and so on, or dates. You just need to find out, out of, say, 10 children, how many are fully, how many partially, how many none or no card. Very simple, very quick. You know, when you do measles campaigns, you do a rapid survey, is that right? Yes? You know the rapid RCA, they call rapid convenient survey? Yes, that's what this is. But we're not just looking at measles vaccine, we're looking at all the vaccines. Same idea. Uh, people, you know, you've already done surveys for measles campaigns and polio campaigns, yes? In addition, we can also look at indicators that you're probably already collecting at the health facility or possibly the district level to get an idea of how well services specifically directed towards high-risk communities are being managed. Um, so what you can see here is a few possible indicators that you could use um, to help make sure that these high-risk communities are really getting the kind of attention um, and services that they need. And as you look at these, I would just ask you, are you already collecting some of this information? And are you already using some of this type of information? I don't think there's anything too unusual here. So first one, you know, what percent of facilities that serve high-risk communities have stockouts of vaccines or other supplies? Do they have available equipment or are they lacking it? Without that kind of essential input, the services can't be provided to those high-risk communities. And sometimes the facilities serving high-risk communities themselves um, have their own uh, difficulties. Uh, what about the number of immunization sessions scheduled and the percent of the scheduled sessions that are actually held? This can come directly from the form that um, uh, Julian was just describing. Um, when we have worked in some countries to monitor the percent of scheduled sessions actually held, um, we've seen in some places that it held steady, which was disappointing. But then we looked at the numerator and the denominator for that indicator, and we saw that actually there were many, many more sessions being scheduled than in the past, but the resources had not yet been mobilized to actually make all of those sessions take place. Um, a third one, getting back to the importance of the community, is uh, can we monitor whether community focal points actually have been identified, whether they have been trained, and where th whether they are still serving in that capacity? Um, uh, the question here is, you know, if there is turnover among those community focal points, you can use that kind of information to make sure that they are really uh, uh, trained and capable of carrying out the responsibilities that you'd like from them. Um, obviously, number four, the issue of availability and funding and other resources, including human resources, to reach hum uh, high-risk communities is essential. Um, number five, the completeness and timeless, timeliness of reporting on coverage from facilities that serve those high-risk communities can also be used to help get a sense of whether uh, the services for them are really functioning at the level needed. So all of those sorts of indicators, well, for the most part, those are indicators that take advantage of information that you're probably already collecting. 
but maybe we could just take a moment uh, to to look into that. You know, do you have? Are you already collecting this kind of information? Do you already use this type of information? Can you make better use of it specifically to focus on services for those high-risk communities that you've identified? And are there other types of indicators that you are already uh, tracking um, that could be used to try to focus attention on those underserved and high-risk communities? And with what frequency, how often do you think these sorts of indicators would be reviewed? Would that be uh, every quarter, six months? What do you think? Rick? Uh, about surveillance. Surveillance. Yes, certainly. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And uh, in Iraq, we don't. Uh, we maybe not all of them done. Uh, especially number three, uh, community focal point identified. What's you meaning by this? Uh, there is some person responsible about uh, this. We yes. don't have, but. Uh, uh -huh all the health center, district, DOH, and also at the national levels, we know the <coughs> high risk and uh, following monitoring them. I see, okay, great. Yeah, for that number three, that was kind of going back to the earlier discussion about making sure that there are representatives from the community I, who are participating okay, yes. in the planning and the monitoring and so okay. forth. Thank you. So I was getting back to that, thank you. Thank you very much. And that, that last comment about the community leads us to this next point here. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm going back up here. Right. Okay. Okay. Sorry, this is a terrible slide. It's got too much writing on it. But it's all about managing communication between health center and community. Now, the point here, what's the point of this? The point is that if you need to connect the health center and the community, this is on page nine, if you need to connect the health center and the community, you need to manage that connection. It is not automatic. It has to be managed. It means really that the health center has to manage it. Has to, there are certain things that must be in place to make that connection work. Otherwise, you know, the two are apart. The community health center are apart. They don't get together. How to make them get together? Well, there are tasks for health center. I'm not going to read them all out. There are tasks for the health center staff to do, and there are tasks for the community to do. And there are basic things like knowing the names of the, and dates of birth of children and sharing that. Very simple ideas. So management, managing the link between the community and the health center. That's what this is all about. I have put a red circle around there about having a regular, say, a monthly meeting. It could be a quarterly or monthly meeting with the community focal points in the health center. That's a possibility to invite the communities uh, who are marginalized to come to the health center and maybe you can get some information, new births, uh, those who need to be followed up, what kind of session plan, sessions they need, and, and so on. Suspected adverse events, of course, and maybe even uh, suspected measles cases and diphtheria or pertussis or whatever. But the idea is it's part of the management. If you want to connect the health center and the community, you have to manage that connection because it's not going to be automatic. And actually having a meeting scheduled, even if it's just every quarter, is a great way to manage. You make that connection, invite them. It does mean a bit of a budget, probably paying some kind of allowance for travel uh, and, and food or something, decide whatever is uh, available. But this is the point. Uh, and then tasks for both. So the responsibility on the side of the community and on the health center. That's what all this is about. And now just some very quick uh, comments from you whether you think this is feasible and probably some countries are already doing this very well. So we'd like to hear a little bit from you. Point is that very often the health center gets a budget, but it's not enough for the real costs of reaching their target population. Because the budget is not made at the health center, it's made at a higher level and the money is distributed in, in a certain ways. So 
the point of this now as a management tool is to consider, to consider whether this kind of tool would help develop the real costs for a health center to reach all its population, whether it is outreach uh, and with one day or mobile where you have to go for more than one day. Uh, with those are the terms we've used, but uh, there doesn't matter about the terms, but it's the idea uh, whether you need to spend an overnight or not. So you can see here, um, there we are identifying the marginalized ones, the distance, number of sessions, the staff, staff costs, and so on. So is that something realistic? Is, there, is it possible even to fill in one line of this? Do we know the cost? Can we give an example of what it would cost? Um, do you have a, uh, perhaps an example in your minds? What do you think? Could people give that a try? Um, think of one particular community where you have to do outreach. This is an outreach budget. It's not looking at fixed sites. Could we give that a try and try and write down what you think might be the costs? And interesting to see what the total cost would be because it might be quite a lot of money um, to do an outreach. Could we? Yeah, here it is. The supervisory checklist. Look, it's one piece of paper on two sides. So, uh, it's coming round now. If you haven't got it, I hope there's enough. For, it's not actually on. It's not in here. It's a separate piece of paper. Sorry, uh, that's right. It's just a very simple checklist, which a supervisor could possibly use to follow what we've been doing on the microplan. That's all. I don't think we need to look at it in detail now. I just want you to consider um, when you are monitoring and following up, maybe this is one way to do it because it's very, it's very simple. It's one piece of paper. Supervisory tools are often like a book, too big. This is just one piece of paper. Eight steps. And now we are reaching maybe, I uh, just have maybe one or two comments regarding the budgeting. Sometimes there's some uh, misconceptions. So, as I understand, for example, in Jordan, they have a system well established since decades for reaching hard to reach areas. And the ministry is providing the transportation. And it's one of the duties of the health staff to go to this area. And as a small country, then they can go and return back on the same day. So there is no BRDMs. Correct me, that's right. Okay, so this is the system. The budget which is allocated there is no additional budget because we are, as a ministry, providing you with the transportation. The driver is there, and you are, as a health staff, part of your daily duties is to go to this area and return back at the end of the day. Uh, and I think, to some extent, as I understand, it's the same in Egypt, that the, the, the ministry provide with the transportation and ask the staff to go to there, finalize the work, and return back. So what is missing here, it's clear that there is no incentive or there is no allowances for the health worker who went to this area. The situation may be a little dif different in big countries or in hard situations. Maybe this is applicable in Sudan. As I understand, in Yemen, I, was, I worked for a long period of time, and we tried to do the same system, and we tried this doing micro plans at a certain stage and asking people to develop and to, ident and to differentiate between these areas where they can reach on the same day, so it's an it's a outreach activity, and areas which need, which is in the third level, that to go and to have an overnight. And we discovered that 95% of the country is in this very distant area. All they develop their plans and they bought only that <laughs> there is nobody is nearby can be reached on the same day because there is no incentive, and they want the incentive. So sometimes it needs maybe to look for a compromise in between, neither to drop completely that the health worker should go and return back on the same day, a kind of incentive, and we maybe that during the development with the support coming from Gavi, we try to give, and we call it out lunch. So if the health worker will go to even return back the same, he will not have his lunch at home. And he want maybe to, to have a small incentive to do this work. Uh, for the budget, if it's developed at the uh, lower level, which is the health facility level, 
at the end it will be compiled it will be in a one plan at district level and then from the district level it varies according to the system in the country okay so uh, different experiences from different countries they have micro plans either for immunization alone or integrated with package of service at country level decision making process uh, taking place at different levels of the health system some of them at federal level central level but let us now to think about the micro plan at the health facility level if we will start our planning exercise at this grassroots level at the health facility level where we are looking specifically for a certain community we want to advocate for these plans we want to get funding for this plan we want to incorporate these plans within the bigger framework of our ministry or federal level and so on so what do you think is it possible from your current experience do you have plans for immunization within the overall plan of the uh, because okay from uh, an initiative that started by Gavi, WHO, UNICEF, with these five-year plans. There is very nicely developed plans. But are these plans part of the budgeting cycle in your country? There is a, or it's the, 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 the allocation of budget is completely separate and there is a budget. And if there is a budget for the health sector specifically, is it including the immunization? And if immunization program is there, there is something to do, some outreach activities or something like that. There is already a seed for such exercise or you are starting from scratch. So this is my first question. Uh, there is maybe, it's a detail, but it's a very important one that about that sometimes it's difficult to reallocate funds for such outreach activities because the budget cannot fit. There is money for contracts and so on. Who decide on this amount? That you should have this amount for contract and not this amount for, uh, for transportation. Okay, decision makers. At the end, so maybe another story that I was working in, in Yemen and we are a very poor country and we don't have money. But in 2005, we were able to create something in the overall government budget, and that's a success story, called outreach. Ministry of Finance are not so keen to put a name that you like. They are so keen about ceilings. How much do you want in total? And for these small details, it's your business as a Ministry of Health or as a federal level or at a district level. They are not so keen to know because at the end you can't decide. But if you are asking more money, yes, this is for them. So, for example, in most of the countries that there is an annual increase in the budget. So if there is a, a, a willing within the ministry at central level, at provincial level, they can decide that we can have this year this money to go for outreach activities for hard to reach areas and this will be distributed according to micro plans. So at the end, I think it's not a major issue, even in a very difficult situation that to fund this one most of middle income countries they are funding their vaccines from their own budget and that's the big lump sum of money for vaccines so it's an additional amount to ensure that equity and to ensure that the immunity level in the country is very high and there is no marginalized group or certain groups are not immunized so it's an argument by the ministries and you can do it and there is a room for it and you can reallocate some of your funds accordingly and that's experience from different countries also in the region so now continuing who are your target group for these plans for the advocacy it's another dimension even during the plan and if you develop the plan you should not work alone you can also if you are involving communities if you are involving people at lower level they can be part of your advocacy team so they can also support you in this advocacy exercise with ministries, with authorities for allocating funds. So that's maybe a, a brainstorming uh, session for how can we try to, to, to implement maybe for next year some of these micro plans for some priority health facilities in priority areas for priority target groups from different sources available. And then how can we build our system maybe for next year. Nahad. 
Okay, thank you very much. So it's clear that there is different opportunities within the region with different uh, uh, status of different countries and they can do something and we still have some time. We are in September, we still have three months, not less than three months, we have two months maybe for finalizing the budget and we should try something. We should incorporate some of these plans for next year. We should do it in a phasing approach. We should not be uh, over ambitious. We should use different channels for advocacy. We should involve communities. We should involve lower levels. We should involve parliamentarians. We should uh, representatives that they can advocate for additional budget. We can use available resources from donors. Gavi, they are supporting now. WHO and other countries, UNICEF will support countries. But also, we should put in mind a long-term process for sustainability, how can, and that's approach maybe in Sudan, that they are have a local contribution of 25%, and even if you have external one, you should think about mobilizing some national resources. Thank you. Just to wrap up, um, during this session, we've tried to put you in two different places. Firstly, as healthcare workers in a health center, and secondly, as managers and supervisors. We tried to put the two things together. Thank you very much for your comment. And you know, um, we are delighted to hear when people say, well, this form is fine, but we need to change it. We need to alter it. That's exactly what we want to hear, because when you say that, it means that you take ownership. Of course, please adapt. This is not policy. We love to hear that you want to take it and change it to suit your own country. That's fine.